Welcome everyone. You're watching Coronavirus in Context. I'm Dr. John White, the Chief Medical Officer at WebMD. Have you been vaccinated? Well, if you're in the United States, there's a high chance that you either have already been vaccinated or you're on a list to get vaccinated or you're starting to figure out how you're gonna do that by May. But around the world, the story is not quite the same. So to address this issue that we're not safe until we're all safe, I've asked Melissa Fleming, who heads global communications at the United Nations, to come back and tell us what's going on. Melissa, thanks for your time again today. It's nice to see you. It's great to see you too, John, and thanks also for thinking about the rest of the world. Now, the United Nations has launched a new initiative called Only Together. Tell us about that. Why do we need that right now? Well, scientifically, it's very clear. Uh, only when everyone everywhere is vaccinated will we get out of this pandemic. So, uh, but how to deliver that message in a way that hits people's hearts? Uh, we decided to, to launch a, a, a campaign that allows people to think about what will I be able to do when I can get back to the things I love. Um, and that's the first thing. So people are saying, you know, I will hug again. I will dance again. I will go to a concert again. It's very much with engaging with interactions with other people. It's not really materialistic at all. Uh, but the secondary message, which for us is the primary message is for people to then say, I know that I can only do this when everyone has the chance to be vaccinated. But people don't think like that typically, right? You're thinking about yourself, community, um, we don't necessarily have a, a global perspective. You had a great piece in media where you talk about having gotten the vaccine, a, a prioritization based on your cancer history, you're open about it in the piece, and you have this great line where you talk about that it's a spirit of hope and celebration. But now you wanna turn your attention to those people that are still waiting their turn, especially globally. So talk to our audience as to why do they need to worry about what's happening in the rest of the world? Someone might say, I'm not gonna travel anywhere. I don't do international travel. We need to protect everyone here first. Well, the virus travels, that's the thing. Um, the virus knows no borders. And I don't think anybody uh, wants to close the borders of the United States or of any country indefinitely. That has major economic consequences, trade consequences, supply consequences, but also just, uh, I know that not everybody travels internationally, but, uh, but the reality is that we are a globalized world um, that depends and relies on each other. And the reality is that the, that the COVID-19 virus is looking is opportunistic and it's, it's looking to cling on to people who are traveling and to continue to, to come back. And, and if, if, um, if it can't latch on to people who've been vaccinated or who are, have antibodies, it, it will mutate. So the faster we get everyone around the world, and this is just the, the strategic self-interest part, vaccinated, mm -hmm. um, you know, the faster we can all go back to doing what we love. Um, but the other thing is just, it's a moral issue, really. I mean, we have countries, low-income countries that did not have uh, the, the financial means, the clout to negotiate deals with pharmaceutical countries early on. And, and many of them haven't received a single dose and what we're talking about are frontline healthcare workers. Um, you know, we can identify with that. Our doctors, our nurses, there they are. They haven't they haven't been vaccinated, and yet they're dealing um, uh, has a, a, well over a year with people uh, with coronavirus, putting their lives at risk every day. And so, this isn't acceptable. We need to get at least them vaccinated, um, and that's what we're working How do we on do with that? the Covax facility. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, how do we do yeah, that? Thanks, John. And we're still, you know, we're we're still in the middle of there's not as much supply as as we would like. Hopefully that's going to change in the next couple of months. But what do we need to be doing 
now as a society to address this point that it, it really is a global issue and that it, it really can be a false sense of security if you only focus on your individual region, or country, or even hemisphere. Um, what do we do now? Well, I think it is maybe when one gets the jab themselves just to think about somebody somewhere else getting it. It could be also uh, people in your own communities who are uh, don't have the access and are unable uh, perhaps to navigate the internet. But I think what we're really talking fundamentally about here is a real divide between rich countries and poor countries. Um, and you know, we have the, the richest countries basically right now having given out or given doses uh, to their populations that represent 80% of the vaccines given. And again, some poor countries not having it at all. Um, and so, you know, as I mentioned, this is, ju it's just, it, it, it's not gonna cut it. We're gonna continue to see the virus circulate around our world unless we uh, really roll out the vaccine everywhere. And what this can be done, it can be, it's possible. And WHO, or saw this along, along with a number of other vaccine international organizations and created this amazing mechanism. It's called the COVAX facility. It's hard to kind of grasp, but it's basically a mechanism that um, if it gets enough funding and donations, and it's already doing this in 57 countries, it will deliver those vaccines at no cost to the countries that can't afford it. And in the meantime, UN organizations like UNICEF are helping to prepare those countries to receive the vaccine and to deliver them. So the mechanism is there, the supply and the funding is not, and that's the problem. We're also calling for a doubling of manufacturing um, so that, and also uh, you know, being generous with patents and licenses. So uh, countries that have the facilities that where they would be capable to manufacture the vaccine so that they're able to do it locally as well. So there are ways and there's when there is a will. I want to be transparent. You and I wrote an editorial together uh, in the Washington Post about this concept of vaccine nationalism and why we felt it was misguided, you know, particularly along the lines that you've talked about. Do you think we're making progress or are we having more of a global perspective? In many ways, as you point out, you can address a pandemic that by its definition is global and then not address it everywhere around the world. It's, it's somewhat short-sighted, isn't it? It is, it is short-sighted. And you know, in a way it's also understandable. I mean, the nature of this pandemic has, has sent us all kind of in isolation in our homes, uh, you know, within little pods, um, within countries closing down borders. And all of this was kind of smart policy to contain, contain the pandemic. And yet now we're asking for people to think globally and to really understand that um, we're not going to indefinitely, and we, we haven't even succeeded in that uh, being able, I mean, we have the UK variant here in New York, uh, the South Africa variant here in New York. The world is globalized and uh, the, the, the virus will travel with uh, the people who bring it. So we need to, to vaccinate everyone everywhere. It's, it's that, simple a concept, uh, but the complexities, of course, are in the details and are in um, uh, making sure that governments uh, also think, uh, thinking about uh, you know, beyond their own citizens. There's still a lot of misinformation about vaccinations, also therapeutics. We know that in many areas of the world, there is greater vaccine hesitancy than there is in the United States, uh, a history of of somewhat anti-vaxxers in some regions of the world. You have the Verified campaign. How are you addressing the issue of misinformation, particularly when it comes to vaccination? Well, you know, as soon as the absolute miracle of science, wonderful news uh, came out that there were two vaccines way back in, I think it was November, um, and now there are many more that could, that were safe and effective against this horrible pandemic that was upending our all of our lives and, and killing so many people and leaving scores more with this horrible, you know, long-term long COVID effects. 
what happened was that there was a spike. It was kind of predictable, but it was really disturbing and it's ongoing of misinformation and conspiracies around the vaccine. Some of it is linked to the same players who were spreading misinformation about COVID itself um, or the politicians who were politicizing uh, the virus um, or denying its existence. So the, pro you know, the problem that we have in this day and age is, that, uh, is how information spreads. It spreads, uh, we have the opportunity to spread good information, trusted information, but so too do the bad actors who are trying to sow mistrust and uh, confusion among the public. So we at the United Nations, first of all, we're just trying to be that trusted source of information. But uh, of course, to compete, we need to make our information also uh, optimized for social media, interesting, engaging, emotive, um, even though it is really just dry uh, science and public health information 101 or how vaccines work and how vaccines will protect you and why vaccines are safe. This kind of information we are trying to put out um, in competition, but also to fill what, what we found are data gaps. So when people are searching for information on the vaccine, um, they're very often not coming up with the most tr trusted sources first, but are confronted with pseudo experts who produced films that are really designed uh, to make you think that this vaccine is, is there to uh, cause mass destruction rather than um, bring about a, a solution and finally um, protection to you, your loved ones, your communities and our world. And you provide guidance in terms of how to help people check out information. Uh, and we can put it up on the screen, particularly in terms of don't share information that may be inaccurate. So you talk about who made it, what is the source? Where did it come from? Why are you sharing this? When was it published? All very good strategies and, and questions to keep in mind before we uh, share it to all of our, our friends, real and virtual. Melissa, we, we chatted about four months ago. I'm gonna call you four months from now and chat again. <laughs> what are we gonna talk about in four months? I, I unfortunately, John, I think we're still going to be talking about vaccine equity. Um, and I think we're also going to be talking about vaccine hesitancy. In four months from now, we'll be in a place where just amazingly in the country we're both in, in the United States, all, all adults who want to be vaccinated will be vaccinated, but we'll have many parts of the world uh, who haven't, uh, where people just haven't seen a vaccine or don't even expect one for a year or two to come. I mean, we, I Here. hope, Wow. well, we are talking now uh, in some countries, the goal of COVAX right now is conservatively to have 20% of a hundred poor and low income countries vaccinated by the end of this year. They're, they're health workers and highly vulnerable people. We hope that that could be 30%. It all depends on donations, but we know that a 30% uh, vaccination in, in a country of a population is nowhere near what you need to get herd immunity. So we're going to have that hopefully here in the U.S. Um, if we get over uh, some of the holdouts and the hesitancy um, have reached what Dr. Fauci has said is needed for herd immunity around 80 uh, percent vaccinated. Um, but in other countries that's going to be far off and so we're going to need to continue um, the US, Canada, the UK, other countries, they have more doses, sometimes five times more they've procured than what's needed for their population. So hopefully more and more countries, rich countries will be sharing these doses so that other countries will be able to benefit as well as an addition. And more manufacturers will have the opportunity to produce their own locally so that they can roll those out fast to the populations. We're only gonna be safe until all of us are safe. I was going to say that you stole my line. So it's not a lot my of line. Work. It's your line. It's the <laughs> line. I'm, I'm really That's glad right. to hear it's a line that's spreading. That's and right. People are starting to get it um, into their ears as the kind, a kind of mantra. So we can be hopeful, which is how we started all your, your shot of hope, but still a lot of work to do. Melissa Fleming, I want to thank you for all that you're doing to communicate good and accurate information around the world 
about how we end this pandemic. Well, John, I want to thank you for communicating good and accurate medical science-based information to the populations in the U.S. and around the world. And if you have questions about COVID, questions about the vaccine or therapeutics, drop us a line. You can email me at drjohn at webmd.net, as well as post on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Thanks for watching.